Tonight, our main speaker is Stephanie. Help me welcome Stephanie. Hi, everybody. My name is Stephanie. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I love Alcoholics Anonymous. It saved my life. I, my sobriety date is July 13th, 1998. So I just got 21 years. And I want to thank Sandy for being the opening speaker, even though she has more time than I do. <laughs> but um, she said some stuff that I really agree with is that this is a fun thing to do we get we have work to do but we have a lot of fun here you know I was I um I don't I'm not really quite sure how to how to start out I I was born and raised in California I had an identical twin sister I have a picture of her she died a month ago of alcohol of alcoholism cirrhosis of the liver and complications she died of multiple organ failure we knew that it was happening I got sober 21 years ago I had like three chances I went to treatment a few times um, and she had chances to get sober too but she hated AA she would say I hate you AA people or you know, it's just stupid, and she just loved her alcohol, and nothing would make her stop. I had always been the, we were, we're identical twins. We were born in um, 1954, February 28, 1954. She was always kind of the, um, the fearless, rebellious one, and I was always the kind of self, um, I don't want to say, um, I was not self-confident. I was the one that was scared. I was the one that was kind of, uh, cowardly and she was kind of the rebel you know she'd try anything and do anything and I was kind of scared of everything we went to school together we were going to go to separate colleges but um, she but then at the last minute she decided to go to the same college as me we went to UC Santa Barbara our parents got uh, divorced when we were 13 we were adopted and I never knew where my what you know what my parentage what my true biological parentage is I have one of those 23 and me kits at home you know to, to do the ancestry but I've never done it I just always had my twin sister neither of us ever got married and we we kind of lived our life together and um, anyway I I just I brought a picture of her this is this is just to let you guys know people die from this from this disease it's really true they'll tell you it ends in death and sanity or uh, hospitals and institutions it's really true and um, I was kind of headed that way too like uh, so I'll tell you basically what happened um, what you do when a speaker shares is, is you say what it was like what happened and what it's like now and I, I didn't start I started out like I was uh, I went to college right after Woodstock so I started college in 1971 so we were all about psychedelic drugs we were all about expanding our consciousness like and I smoked a lot of pot I did a lot of hash I didn't I wasn't I didn't drink in high school I went to an all-girls school and the rebels in our in our school were um, smoked a lot of pot and I was scared of it but I tried it and I thought well under control it'll be okay you know well it'll it'll be okay and I I smoked and enjoyed it and had a couple of bad trips had a couple of times that it was laced with something but like that it drugs wasn't really what I wanted to do I never wanted to do the downer drugs I liked things that kept me up and so I got into speed when I got to college like um, somebody turned me on to to supposedly to study turned me on to white cross dextrines and we got those and they were the little tiny white tabs and they were just called whites this was like 1972-73 and um, I really enjoyed that because I was kind of shy and it made me the life of the party you know I could just talk to anybody and do anything trouble is, is I didn't study I talked and I ran and I rode my bicycle and I thought this is great I just have all this energy and then I had a couple of um, like psychotic breaks I had a couple of, of um, uh, 
times that I, you guys know what the term is, I can't think of it, I got strung out. I got strung out and then I crashed and, and had to go to the infirmary, the hospital infirmary, I mean the, the university infirmary. My parents got called, I got in trouble and, and, then, and I kind of realized the consequences that, you know, that bad things can happen because up until that point nothing had ever happened. I, somehow I got through college. I never drank in college, but I got a BA in art history. And I didn't know, I, at that time, like a lot of people, we just took liberal arts classes. Nobody, well, I'm sure other people did, but I didn't think, what am I going to do? What am I, you know, I need to become a lawyer or a doctor. I need to go to school for that. I, you know, want to go to public relations, want to be, you know, want to be something. I never thought about that. I just wanted to have fun. And, um, when I got done with college, I, I was on the six-year plan. It took me six years to get through college. I didn't have a plan of what to do, and so I, my mom made me uh, take typing. She had made me take typing before I went away to college, and so she said, well, you're going to be a legal secretary. You know, go apply for, for um, you know, jobs as a legal secretary. And I did that, but I, I always had that psychological thing of, like, people aren't going to like me. I, I don't know how to talk to people. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. And that's often where alcohol comes in is, is just the social lubricant. You know, you start drinking with people and it, you have this sense of we, like we're all doing this. So I, used, I started out going away. Um, after I, I worked in several different law firms. I was a legal secretary. I never thought I did a very good job, but it was a job. But I, I just had uh, trouble with my social relationships. So one day, um, I was, and I was scared of the men. I was scared of the, it was mostly male attorneys that we worked for. And I was, I was like inhibited and I was, um, what's the word for it? Um, I was just, I was just afraid of people. I was just afraid of making a mistake, afraid of doing the wrong thing, saying the wrong thing, making a mistake on a document I was working on. I was just this terrified little person. So I started going out for a happy hour with some of the girls from work. And we, there were a lot of uh, Mexican restaurants uh, near the, the law firms, near the, the business community. I was in Newport Beach, California. And I fell in love with tequila and shooters and and just that whole happy hour lifestyle I just really got into it and that was that was right after I got back from from college so the years went on and I, I couldn't keep a job that long I mean I think the longest job was like six months to a year and a lot of it was just um, it was I just didn't know who I was. I didn't have confidence and I couldn't just walk out the door in the morning and say, I'm going to do a good job today. I was just always afraid of everything. And when you get, when you get into this program and you start to read the big book, it'll say, you know, there's just a hundred different forms of fear that our lives, lives is just shot through with it. That was my experience. I was just afraid of everything. I was afraid of guys. I was afraid of work. I was afraid of authority. I was afraid of the police. I was afraid of my parents. I was afraid of doing the wrong thing. I was just scared, scared, scared little kid and even as they, they talk about arrested development you know just a, even if you chronologically go through the years you know being 25 26 27 whatever you can still stay 13 years old and I think that's what I was because I'd started smoking pot when I was about 13 and looking back on it now you know with a, with a lot of years of sobriety I see exactly what happened um, and I drank more and more because it's progressive. I started quitting jobs before I would get, um, and we're talking about like, like 20 years of, of job history from like probably age uh, 22 getting back from college or probably 24 to about 42. So probably more like, you know, like 18 years or 16 years. I, I can't do the math right now. I started... Um, when I didn't work anymore, um, because my my dad was was pretty well off, and he just he gave me money, and they call it having enough um, rope to hang yourself with in treatment. I learned that later. I was free. I just I couldn't work anymore. I didn't work anymore, and nobody was hounding me about not working anymore. My dad had bought me a house, and and it bought my sister a house too. We were eight houses away from each other. 
and I started just having parties at my house. My sister played in a rock band. She was a, a singer and a keyboard player, and she was really, really good. Remember I told you she was the rebel, and she was the one that had all the self-confidence, and and um, I I kind of drank to get that confidence, and my sister was just out there anyway. She didn't really need to drink, but she actually had a working profession for a long time as a as a, um, a singer in like five, six different bands. In fact, at, at her uh, service, at her celebration of life that we had about a month ago, about 10 guys were there that had played with her through the years. And and um, she just never quit drinking. Everybody else like quit because we're all old now. I mean, I'm 65 and so are all the rest of our friends. And and um, my sister just never quit. I quit at 44, but my sister just kept drinking. Anyway, um, uh, the, those guys were my friends too. And after the bar gigs were over that, that they all played at, they all came over to my house. And, and then we'd just have a party all night long. And I was kind of known as the, the gal with the house that everybody went to after the bars closed. So we got heavily into cocaine too. And I know this is an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, but um, my my life started with drugs. And al I mean, alcohol was always the main drug, but like cocaine was the fuel that kept it going, kept it going through the night, kept it going into the next day. And, um, I, and I always had people to to join in the festivities, but I had the house, I had the party, was the party, did the party, and I was the doormat that everybody would come to, drink all my booze, do all my drugs, and I was the one that provided everything. And I, they'd spill drinks on my on the couches and spill drinks on the carpet, and I was like good with that. I was fine with that, sort of like, but I'm the girl with the party. You know, that was giving me my self-esteem at that time. And then I started getting DUI. I'd, al I'd also run out late at night um, because we'd run out of Coke, and I knew where the dealer was and how late he was. You know, he would stay up. I'd call him, and they, people would say, you know, if you, if, if you fly, we'll buy. And they'd pass the hat, and we got, you know, I'll, we got money together. And, I mean, I lived this crazy kind of life that I knew – uh, I, I knew it was going to come to an end someday. I just knew it was. I actually kind of wished it would, but I didn't know how to stop. Um, I was always looking in the rearview mirror for the cops um, because I, I did get, and, and I finally started getting DUIs, and thank God, I'm really, really grateful that I got DUIs because that's what finally brought this, you know, the shit show to an end because it really was getting bad toward the end. I just, I couldn't stop. I'd started to have seizures. I'd gone to the hospital a couple of times because when you withdraw, you know, some of you guys know, when you withdraw from alcohol, when you're drinking heavily, when you're drinking heavily for days, then you withdraw, you suddenly go into DTs or the shakes or have a grand mal seizure. And um, I, st I had uh, three or four of those. And that was really starting to scare me. And again, Somebody said in a meeting today, this is my third meeting of the day today, <laughs> by the way. Um, some guy said in a noon meeting today, he said, somewhere in my soul, I knew that there was a better way to live and that I would be my real self someday. And I remember vividly having a vision of that, like, God, where is my real self? And it was just my soul saying, you're in there somewhere. We're going to get there. We're going to get to that. And when I got my second DUI, um, the first one was 0.32, and I'm 95 pounds. And um, the next one was 0.23. The, the first one, I, I was in a blackout. And um, there were lots of consequences from that, and it just took a lot to get through it. And then the second one, I was 0.23, and the, and the cop told me that I'd sideswiped his car on the way. And I was almost home, and I just was like, but I just live over there. And he goes, you sideswiped my car. You are not going home. You didn't even know you were sideswiping a police car. And it, but in the back of my mind, I was thinking, thank God, I'm, I'm, somebody stopped me. I don't know if anybody ever saw Jim Carrey, the movie with Jim Carrey called The Mask, but he, he is in this crazy character with a green face, and he goes, somebody stop me. And I remember thinking at that, at that time, thank God somebody's stopping me, because I didn't know how to stop myself. And um, the consequences for that second one got even worse for that second DUI. But at the very last minute, by kind of a, 
a fluke um, of fate, and I know it was God. I My dad had stopped giving me money. I didn't have anything. I didn't have any money in my checking account. I was sitting in my house that had been wrecked by all the parties, and I knew that my um, there it was. I knew that my um, the DUI was going to a failure to appear probation violation. I knew the, the police were going to be coming to pick me up and take me to jail for I was going to have to do six months. And I went out to my mailbox one day, and I knew that they were coming any day. I had no idea exactly what day, but I went out to my mailbox, and I hadn't had a, um, a credit card in a long time. I had had a American Express that had gotten totally maxed out, and I went to my mailbox, and there was a Visa card in there that I had not asked for, I was not eligible for, I hadn't applied for it, and I a, a Visa card with my name on it, with a, a credit line of fifteen thousand dollars. And I just went, I called, I thought it was an ATM card. I had no money in my account, but I, I called the number on it because back then you had to call a number and activate it. And it was a woman in Dallas, the, the head of uh, the Bank of America credit card division or whatever. And she was, oh, no, ma'am, that's a, that's, a, that's a credit card, and it has $15,000 on it. And I just went, oh, my God. The next day the police came to pick me up at my house, but they called. I was in a gated community. They called from the gate, and... I just thought, oh no, 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 no! I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to jail. They came to my front door. I took my purse with my Visa card and jumped over the fence and ran from them. They got into my house. They call, were calling to me. There was this wilderness area out in front of my house. It was on a, it was on the back bay in Newport Beach, and they were calling to me from a megaphone, like, okay, well now you've got an evading arrest to add to your, you know, to your rap sheet. You could either come to us now or your consequences are going to be worse. And I was like. I'm out here and I'm free right now. I'm going to take my chances. I checked into a hotel and stayed in a hotel for a week. And, um, but I knew the gig was up. And I, a friend came and partied with me some more and I knew the gig was up. I finally sent him home and just called. A, I actually called my sister and she called and she was a legal secretary too. And she got me an attorney and the attorney said, go turn yourself into a 90-day a recovery home. And I did. And um, I was able to stay there, didn't have to go to jail, and I immediately heard what I had been like hungry to hear for the longest time. For the first first thing was I was not happy when I saw God on all the pages of the big book. I went, "Oh no," cuz I'd had a bad experience in my youth with uh with religion. I I was raised in a religion that's kind of a cultish religion. I I don't say the name of it anymore, but I just didn't like it and I left it when I was about thir 12 or 13 years old. And I, and then they said to me in treatment, I love this treatment that I went to. It was called Sober Living by the Sea. It's now called Hotel California. It still exists. <laughs> like uh, Hotel California, you can check in, but you can't check out. Or, or you can never leave, the Eagles song, you know. Um, but I, I, the women's director, I just loved. She was a walking big book. She had this grace and dignity, and I just wanted to be just like her. I, my first speaker meeting that I went to, there was a woman that got up and did the 45-minute uh, speaker share, and I just went. I, I had like two weeks when I heard her and two weeks of sobriety, and I said, I'm going to stay sober, and I'm going to do that someday. You know, it was kind of like the performer and my sister that made her an that made her a, a rock singer. The performer was in me too, because we're identical twins. But I wanted to be a speaker in AA. I just kind of made that made that goal for myself at two weeks of sobriety, and um, I did. I I stayed there for three months. I had to be there for three months. But I just I remember that vividly of just thinking I want to get it. But it wasn't that I wanted the ego trip of getting up in front of people for performing. It was like I want to be sober. I want to spread this message. I want people to know how good it is. I want to be a walking big book. I want to be an attraction rather than a promotion. I don't want to have to hammer it to anybody. I want it to be that I live my life in such a way that makes people say, "Wow, that AA must be must be really work must really work." And I saw a lot of people that were really happy, that had really good lives. And, and I, I went to speaker meetings as often as I could. And I stayed there. I only had to be there for three months, but I stayed another three months because people were going to school. They, they had a school uh, program where you could go to Saddleback 
um, community college and take classes. And because remember, I told you when I was in college, I really didn't know what I was doing. We got to take classes in either law enforcement or human services or um, medical, like learning how to be a medical tech. And I was 44 years old, and I just remember feeling like a kid again, like I was getting a do-over, like God had given me another chance. And I just kept, I just, you know, I, I took classes there. Then when I got out of treatment six months later, it was like January, I... Um, I went to UCI and I studied a few more classes. I went back to my uh, art history classes and took a, you know, like I, I felt like I was getting mainstreamed again. I felt like I'd been on the shelf for so long and my low self-esteem was because I'd done nothing with my life and I had so much shame that I thought, well, I'm going to do what they told me to do. They just said get into service, look for look for avenues where you could be of service. So I took a job in a in a hospital, I, t- I took a one day a week volunteer um, commitment at the local hospital because my mom had died two years before I got sober. She had had cancer, and I neglected her, and I didn't take her to chemo. There's so many opportunities. There were so many things that I could have done for her, and I didn't. And so they taught me that the only way that you can fix that is to make a living amends and it may not even be to the person that you owe it to that you wish that you had been able to help but you do it for somebody else so I took a job doing wheelchair transport one day a week at Hoke Hospital and then um, and I did that for 17 years and then I saw um, and then and did a lot of other things too I did H&I which is hospitals and institutions I spoke um, I took my own panel into um, recovery homes and spoke to people there and I I just did everything everybody told me to do I got a sponsor I have a sponsor now I sponsor other girls one of my sponsees is here and um, I still have some girls that I sponsor in Newport Beach and I, I go back and forth uh, to Newport I've been here for four years I moved four years ago out here because um, I knew my sister was never going to get well, and I had kind of been hoping to, you know, to help her get into AA or whatever, and then it was becoming really obvious she wasn't going to do this. She just did not want this. And another friend of mine from Newport moved here. She was married with a 16-year-old daughter, and she loved it here. And I, I was like, what's, what's Prescott, Arizona? What's, what's a Prescott? And she, and so she said, well, come out here and see. And I was able, you know, they, she and her husband were able to get a really nice house, and so I started coming out here and visiting, and um, I bought a house, I found a beautiful house, and I moved here, um, actually, November 17th of 2015, so this coming, um, the November 17th, it will have been four years that I've been here, and then my, my friends who moved here before I did, her husband got cancer they were only 50 her husband got cancer and died last year and I came to see that it was God's God was um, put us all in the same place so we could all be a picket fence to each other and they one thing I heard when I first got here was God's timing is perfect and everything that's happened in my life I'm realizing I was moved here because God knew he was going to take my sister you know, off the planet, take her out of her misery, and he wanted me to go on and have a good life. And I've always felt like my mission was to help others, you know, to stay sober and help other alcoholics, because that's what our mission is. That's the best thing that we can do. And life is good. I didn't know what life was. I thought it was just partying and having fun with you know, my friends, and then we all got older, and people got married, people had kids, and I saw people fall away from that party life, and I I couldn't stop on my own. Nothing was making me stop. I never got married. I never had kids, and I really was kind of resigning myself, like, I guess I'm just going to die, That, but that was 21 years ago, or even prior to 21 years ago. I just assumed life was just going to be over, like I would just kind of fade out like a movie ending, and God had other plans for me. I see 
so vividly that it was God that did this all for me. I, I moved here and immediately got into service. You guys, I, some of you maybe went to the uh, Prescott Shoestring Roundup in the summertime. I got here and I started working on that. I worked in hospitality for the first two years, and now I'm working in publicity. Um, just like Sandy was saying, there's so many things to do here. You can be a greeter for a meeting. You can be a secretary, a treasurer. I'm a treasurer for another meeting. Um, I always now, whenever I go anywhere or do anything, I introduce myself and say, what can I do to help? You know, if I'm, if I'm uh, a little bit nervous or shy or don't know people or whatever, not really shy anymore, but um, I just always say, what can I do to help? Even if you go to a, um, even if you go to like a Thanksgiving dinner, you know, just that concept of being of service, of helping, of helping out is, is what's really saved my life. And um, just out of curiosity, I'm just curious, are, are, I, because my, my main thing was alcohol, but like, is, is anybody here just alcohol, or are you guys mostly drugs? Just, just who, who's mostly alcohol? Okay, good, there's a lot of alcoholics. And is anybody just into drugs? Just drugs? Okay, so it's kind of like half and half. I was, uh, how about a combination of the two? Yeah, yeah, so I mean, the, the thing is, the thing is, is though, I didn't know that there was a way to live without drugs and alcohol. I had no idea that there was something to do to, to you know, make your life fun, to make your life happy, because that's all I knew. So anyway, it, it, all you guys that are new, you guys are all so young. Just know you don't have to wait until you're 40, 35, 40 to get sober. Like, if you get sober now, you could do so much with your life. And my only regret, and I, I can't regret it, it's my path, but is that I didn't do more with my life. But I got here at 44, and I plan to stay here for the rest of my life. Anyway, thank you for listening. Thank you, Sandy. Stephanie, sorry. Stephanie, thank you, Stephanie. This has been a regular meeting of the Rarely Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. You are cordially invited to join us again next week. Please bring a friend. There are approximately 100 meetings of AA each week in the Prescott area. We hope we advise that you attend as many as possible, and we hope you'll join us again soon. After the prayer, will the people who volunteered to do that stuff do that stuff? And your court cards are in the back right corner with Kirk. Let's circle up and say the Lord's Prayer. Thank you all for coming.